I'm going to talk to you today about a very different context, uh, albeit it is about money. But my, 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 the way I look at the Olympic Games is a little different. I've, I've worked on, uh, let's see, how do I do this? I'm not sure. I, I, know, I know this works, so I'll try that one. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm a lawyer, not an economist. Uh, thank goodness I don't have to worry about all the things that uh, <laughs> Professor Owen talked about. But uh, uh, I do sports and entertainment. Uh, I was uh, the, the uh, lead attorney for uh, uh, the engagement that our firm had with the uh, Beijing Organizing Committee. I've worked on the Salt Lake City Games. I am doing a few things for the London Games. Uh, and, um, and I have represented an Olympic athlete. And, uh, and I do represent other sports franchises and so on, mainly international type of stuff. Uh, enough about me. Um, just talking about the Olympics from the perspective that I looked at the Olympics, which was business. Uh, the, the Olympic movement, just so you'll know, is, is sort of divided into sort of, you know, two big worlds, if you will. Uh, at the top of the, uh, of, of the uh, chart is the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. And then uh, on one side is the, uh, is the marketing and that represented by the National Olympic Committees and the, uh, uh, and, uh, the National Olympic Committees have the marking rights for their individual territories, like the USOC for the United States and uh, the COC for China and so on. On the other side of this chart is the IF, the, the International Federation for Sports. The, uh, the organizing committees do have to deal with the IS, but, uh, but, but I didn't uh, have to deal with them. I mean, they have to deal with the IS because the IS are in charge of the sport. So when you build a venue, uh, they, they have to build the venue to the specifications that the sport requires. If the venue is for basketball, it's got to be Olympic standards. And, and so it's important stuff, but you know, uh, we didn't get involved in that. We were mainly over on the side that dealt with money. Now, just to give you perspective, the first uh, Olympic Games were held in, uh, in the modern era in 1896. Uh, I found this uh, information on the internet and, and all of the information I'm going to give you today, by the way, I found on the, uh, the internet. I am not giving you any proprietary information that the Chinese government gave me. And by the way, I don't have any. Uh, so <laughs> uh, they, that was basically my relationship with them. You know, we'll give you an assignment, you do it. And uh, you know, sometimes they thank me and sometimes they didn't. Although I will tell you that the seven, uh, seven year experience that I had was by, uh, 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 by and large a very positive one. And I enjoyed it very, very much. And I'm very sad that it's ending. 67% uh, of the cost was by private donations. And uh, where was I? 22 from the sale of uh, uh, special stamps, and 11% of the cost of the games uh, were, was covered by uh, tickets, coins, medals. Uh, so these are the sources of revenues for an Olympic Games, and this is what we did. I worked on these four areas, although I did work on a lot of entertainment-related stuff. But if you think about it, you know the, the, the Olympic Games is a big entertainment event. And so uh, the reason why people buy tickets or why they want to buy merchandise or why they want to have sponsor the Olympic Games or see it on, on television is because it's entertaining. And, and the spirit of what you heard in the other room a few minutes ago comes through. And the, the drama of somebody winning or somebody losing and the, and the back stories that they tell you, all that's part of the Olympic Games. Well, the first Olympic Games, 60,000 tickets were sold. Uh, in Beijing, it was about 7 million tickets. Uh, the ticket prices uh, were set at between $3.82 and $638 was the price for the opening ceremonies. I understand that the people who went to the opening ceremonies, by the way, were completely miserable. It was a spectacle on television, but it was the 390s, 90 degrees, 90 degree humidity, and 90,000 people, so you can figure <laughs> it out. Uh, the, uh, the demand was very, very high. Uh, and uh, so uh, you can uh, just sort of the, uh, you can see by the demand, uh, and look at this slide really quickly, that uh, the estimated revenues were about 140 million to 210 million. 
Uh, of course, uh, there was an influx of tourists. I can tell you whether the impact was lasting or not, I don't care about that, but during the Olympic Games, you couldn't find a hotel room very easily in the key areas. And restaurants, transportation, there were a lot of people there. I was, I was there, and uh, it was uh, the spirit, and people were happy and spending money, and all that happened. So there we go. That's our running total right there. Uh, licensing. So that's the second area. And licensing, by the way, and this is important because of the remarks I'm going to make at the very end, uh, what's the impact of all this. Uh, licensing involves uh, the, the exploitation of trademarks and the Olympic symbols. Uh, so uh, again, remember the first Olympic Games, 1896, they were selling special stamps, commemorative coins, and medals. That same concept still exists in spades now, even now in the modern Olympic era. Uh, especially starting in 1984, uh, they had some marketing geniuses out here in Los Angeles that, that really knew how to capitalize on this. and their, the lessons that they uh, taught the world have been well learned by other Olympic organizing committees. Uh, I am wearing a tie, by the way, that was uh, given to me by my client. It has, it's an official tie, I promise you. I'm not wearing counterfeit goods. But you can see uh, this is the symbol that Beijing used. Everybody recognizes it by now. It was a big deal when it was revealed. We had to you know, go around and by stealth register this in several uh, markets in the world. Here are the mascots, another big part of licensing the games. Here's a slide with some of the merchandise. It was estimated that about 4,000 products. Actually, this estimation was low. Uh, I think it was more in the, in the line of about 7,000 products. And the estimation was about $70 million. Uh, that is probably low also. But uh, anyway, there's our scorecard. Uh, 1986. Uh, we're going to talk about sponsorships now. What are sponsorships? We'll talk about in a minute. But uh, there were no sponsorships in 1986, just private donations. The, uh, here's the, uh, the five rings. Uh, everybody knows what they are. This is one of the most, if not the most, recognized logo in the world, or trademark, if you will. Uh, it was first used in the games of 1920, and it's been used uh, prominently ever since. Um, Every games, in addition to the IOCs or the Olympic logo, every games has a logo of its own. Beijing had one. The one on the far right there is the London uh, uh, Olympic logo. And, uh, you know, a lot of money is paid for these, these logos, and they're registered in uh, many, many countries around the world uh, uh, as trademarks. Um, what, what a sponsorship means is exclusive association the legal and exclusive association with the trademark. And um, it's, this is a little bit complex, and I don't know if you want to get into this, but you can ask me questions afterwards, I guess, if you're interested. But uh, the, the games sponsors only have marketing rights in China. That's a, that's a big surprise to a lot of people. So if the games are being held in the United States and you become an official sponsor of, the, say, the Chicago games, you will only have marketing rights in the US. Uh, and, uh, and there are certain sponsors, uh, the, the so-called uh, the Olympic partners or the top sponsors, they have worldwide marketing rights. So there's two sort of classes. But if you want this logo, and that's, that's what you want, that's what, that you can only have marketing rights in China. Uh, you can have marketing rights in other territories, but you have to make an agreement with the National Olympic Committee of the territory that you're interested in. And all this complexity is really good for lawyers, of course. That's why I was really happy for six and a half years. <laughs> Um, and here's a little bit of uh, uh, the detail of that. It's defined by product category. Uh, there's an allocation between the worldwide sponsors and the game sponsors uh, in terms of product category. So Coke is a worldwide sponsor. So, so Beijing, the Beijing Games, did not have a beverage sponsor. The, they have other categories that were allocated to them by the IOC. There is an, there is an overlap possible uh, on the team level. So, for example, you can have a U.S. Uh, beverage, or not a U.S. beverage sponsor because Coke is in the United States, but there are some overlapping, like financial institutions, it is possible. But, um, but by and large, it, it, it is completely exclusive. Um, hospitality is one of the perks. You can see these, these things. And um, uh, so here are the, here's the bottom line here. There's about a billion dollars in revenues and sponsors when you add it all up together. 
the, the three tiers of sponsors in the Beijing. And uh, this does not count, by the way, the allocation that was given to Beijing from the worldwide sponsorships. So uh, that's a lot of money. And we're, we're cruising right along here in terms of the amount of money that the Beijing Olympics made. Broadcasting, this is the big moment in time right now. Uh, there are roughly 20 territories in the world, or there were before the EBU became uh, broken down, but, uh, but in, in the 2008 games, there were roughly 20 ter territories in the world, and therefore there were about 20 broadcasting contracts that we worked on. And uh, these are very uh, complex contracts uh, and uh, very detailed. And here are some of the issues, uh, well, here's some of the facts. Four billion viewers that were estimated for the Beijing Games. Uh, 17,000 broadcast personnel came into Beijing to uh, help broadcast the Games. And the most important rights holder, of course, is the US. The largest territory is the EBU. And in Japan, all the rights are held by one broadcast consortium. The rights granted are exclusive right to the ITVR signal in the territory, so it's territory exclusivity. And there's a limited right to unilaterally broadcast uh, your own broadcast feed in the in the venues, and the, and the, one of the great contract negotiation points was who's allowed in the venue to create their own unilateral footage and who's not. Uh, new media was a big deal too, you know, the, the internet and so on and so forth. The pricing was negotiated with each rights holder, and is sold on a quadrennial basis, which means uh, if you if you want to buy a broadcast broadcast rights, you buy them for a summer and a winter game of a certain period of time, four-year period of time. The revenues uh, are significant, estimated 1.7 billion, and, and that's about right. And again, this is, this is Beijing's tally only. So there is, uh, uh, that's my last slide. Now I wanna, I wanna uh, just comment uh, on what the impact of this from my point of view of the lawyer. Uh, <clears throat> there, were, um, there were some infrastructure uh, things that were that happened that are important, I believe. Uh, Beijing lost its bid to become the host city. I think it was in 2000 that they they ran against Sydney, and one of the reasons why is because, uh, at least that you know the word on the street is because there there's a fear of China and counterfeit goods and their lack of interest in protecting uh, symbols and logos and trademarks and so on. So this time around, Beijing and the national government both enacted uh, specific statutes. So that infrastructure w is in place. These statutes relate only to Olympic symbols, but it was an important thing to give the IOC the comfort that it needed to uh, make Beijing the, the host city. These, uh, these statutory regimes are important in that they are very much like the statutory regimes that exist in other countries, like the United States. And also they have enforcement uh, uh, you know penalties and so on and so forth attached to them. So the infrastructure to protect the Olympic symbol and the enforcement of those Olymp uh, of those statutes was put in place. The uh, also the mindset, the mindset that uh, that exists uh, among the people that organize the game. Remember, there are thousands of people that were administrating the uh, organization of the games and also enforcing the, these uh, these rights. Uh, of the sponsors and the rights of the uh, of the Olympic uh, organization, it, you know, all of these people now will go back into their their uh, former jobs or their their new, their new jobs. Many of them were from the sports bureau. Many of them were from the government, and so they've they've had not only uh, the the statutory regime, the infrastructure. They've also had experience, and I think in many cases they've developed a mindset. Uh, in my area, which is largely the entertainment business and, and sports generally, uh, I, I've had a lot of discussions with my clients about what, what can we do now? We're a team. Let's, let's do something else. And they're talking about uh, big sporting events, you know, attracting more things to China, doing more things. And, and I, I think, you know, I don't know how, how uh, long-lasting this is going to be, but I do think there is a long-lasting impact. Uh, that happens when, 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 when thousands of people get together to do something on this kind of a scale and, uh, and they enact laws, they enforce those laws, and so on. I think it's, I think it's an important thing, and I do believe that there'll be a, a lasting uh, a, a effect from it. Thank you.